This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. After using Surfshark VPN for about a month, I can honestly say it's enabled me to do a lot of really cool things. I've been able to watch some YouTube videos that have been blocked in my country for years, and I may or may not have downloaded Dead or Alive Extreme Venus Vacation, a game that is pretty much banned in Western regions. <clears throat> and all of this while keeping my personal data safe. Remember, we live in a world where your personal data is worth more than oil, and companies want to know everything about you. If you'd like to shield yourself from that unwanted observation, then protect yourself with Surfshark VPN. It works in the background discreetly and won't get in the way of anything that you're doing. And believe me, I know, I've been using it. You barely know it's there. The generous people at Surfshark VPN have offered my viewers a special deal. By using the code INKRIBBON, you not only get a free 3-month trial, but you also get 83% off your entire subscription. And if you don't like it, they do have a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you've got nothing to lose. Visit surfshark.deals slash inkribbon for more. Link is in the description. Ink Ribbon. So, uh, I'm sure you guys have probably heard the news. There's going to be a new Resident Evil movie, and it has, you know, Claire and Leon and Jill and Chris and mansions and yay, cool. But I got a hold of the original rejected script by George Romero. Yes, the grandfather of the zombie genre, George Romero. Oh my god. <laughs> I cannot wait to tell you guys. So, I decided to take notes, and I took notes of only the important things that I needed to tell you guys. <laughs> Three pages of notes. I hope you guys are ready. I'm just gonna sum up the movie, like, super quick though. It's basically an alternate retelling of the first game. Uh, you know, like the mansion and Jill and Chris and stars and the tyrants, blah, blah, blah. However, uh, it is worth noting this was written in 1997, which means that the script was made before Resident Evil 2 even came out. And um, I don't know if you guys remember, but on the original copies of Resident Evil 2, there was actually a little sticker that was some sort of contest, like you could be in the movie or whatever. And then we didn't get a movie until like 2000 something, whenever the first movie was, 2002, I think. So yeah, things take a while in Hollywood, but I understand why this was rejected. Resident Evil fans, buckle your seatbelts because we're in for a ride. It immediately starts with zombies. Unlike the movie that we got, uh, immediate zombies, and it's like in a laboratory and so close, John Marcus is, involved when actually it's James Marcus, but okay. So he's like getting eaten and then they're in a lab and it's like, you know, it's kind of like in that one scene in the third or fourth Resident Evil movie where they're just watching a guy get eaten and they're just like, oh yes, we're evil umbrella people. Uh. So then it cuts to Chris Redfield bird watching. He is watching an eagle majestically fly through the sunset and he's like appreciating nature and I, I, yeah, I mean, he's, like, really bird-watching for, like, a long time. Like, he's watching birds catch fish, and I don't know why he's bird-watching, but okay. Then we cut to a farmer named Rake, because I don't know why he's named Rake. And uh, he starts noticing that his animals are acting weird, specifically his horses. So, after Chris finishes bird-watching, he goes back to Jill's apartment takes off his clothes, and gets into bed with her. And then they have this, like, really long, cheesy conversation that's, like, the most, like, couple-y, like, how do I, I need to, like, reenact it. Basically, <laughs> it's like, oh, babe, yeah, I, I don't know, I'm not that beautiful. And it's just like, but you are so beautiful, Chris. You're you're the most beautiful thing ever. And he's like, you know, I got to work on it, babe. You're beautiful. And she's like, no, you're beautiful. And then they start making out. And then they fuck. So after Chris and Jill have sex, Chris is passed out because just guy things. And Jill answers a secret phone that she hears vibrating that she keeps in her shoe. <laughs> <laughs> and it, they describe it as like a little like Game Boy looking thing and she goes into like the bathroom and she's all like oh my god like this better not be a drill and then he gives like you can't hear who she's talking to but he gives her a number and she pulls out an envelope and she's like oh, it matches so then she opens like the closet and moves all the clothes and she enters like 
a keypad thing and then a secret door opens and it's like full on Mr. and Mrs. Smith. There's like guns and and battle uniforms and grenades and whatever. So she decks herself out like Rambo and she leaves and of course right as she's leaving Chris wakes up and then he goes to the window and he sees Jill like heading for her car all dressed in like battle uniform and he's like oh my god why is she dying? I don't understand. Ah. So Jill ends up with three guys this Disimone, Russo, and Williams, and they take her to the Arclay Forest, and they reach a mansion, but it's gated, and uh, Jill has, like, a key card that she's wearing as a necklace, I guess as an excuse to have, like, a key card like the games. So they get to the gate, and then they're immediately attacked by dogs, and then we cut to Wesker. Now, before you get excited, Wesker and Barry, they're all in this, but, um... <laughs> they're they're getting ready to go rescue Jill, and then it's revealed that Barry is okay. We know Barry as like oh Jill sandwich. He's a big white guy with beard, and in this version, he's a big strong black man. <laughs> oh God! So yeah, Barry's black. Cool. So meanwhile, back at Jill's apartment, Chris puts on his own battle gear from Jill's closet and then heads to go find her. Now this is interesting. When he leaves, he goes into the streets and everything's on fire. Everyone's screaming. And all of these like civilians are being loaded into helicopters and vans and being taken away. And like the sheriff gets beat up by a military guy because they're like, you can't do this. We have rights and blah, blah, blah. And... I, I don't really know what that was all about, but it's kind of like Umbrella or maybe the UBCS in some form getting rid of people. I'm sorry to be talking so fast, it's just there's a lot to get through and I have to like, this video is going to be really long if I don't. So Chris ends up at Rake's farm and Rake is laying there severely injured and he basically gives Marvin's speech from Resident Evil 2 where he's like, we don't know how this happened, there were zombies and then there was a thing and people died and I don't know what's going on, just leave it out me. So then Chris uh, runs for help and the phone is dead. But he does grab a shotgun, but then on the way back, he sees a horse that apparently he knew named Lucky with its guts hanging out, so he decides to put the horse out of its misery. But by the time he gets back to Rake, Rake has already died. So Chris is like, all right, well, better go find Jill. So then he leaves. As Chris is running through the forest, heading towards the mansion, uh, he sees Wesker and Barry flying overhead in a helicopter and is like, oh, I'm going to follow them. I need to mention something very important about Chris that I just realized I forgot to mention. Uh, in this version of Resident Evil, Chris is not affiliated with stars or law enforcement in any way, shape, or form. In fact, Chris is a civilian and he's Native American. <laughs> and he's also boning Jill. Aside from that, the STARS members are all pretty much there. You've got Brad, who is now the STARS like computer nerd. And then you've got um, you've got Rebecca, you've got Kenneth, and you've got a new character named Rosie Rodriguez, who is described as a tough-built babe. Hmm, Rodriguez, tough-built babe. Why does that sound familiar to me? I don't know. So they land, and they're immediately attacked by dogs, so they all run towards the mansion. As they're running, they shoot the dogs and continue onward, and Chris is watching all this from, like, the forest and the bushes, because he's all, like, doing his Native American thing and being one with nature. So he goes over, checks the dogs, and sees that they're wearing umbrella collars. You know, dun-dun-dun. So Wesker wa walks up to the gate and pulls out a necklace key card just like Jill's, and he opens the gate, and they go in. So at this point, Jill's already been in the mansion. She's been killing monsters. They keep finding evidence of Jill here and there and like footprints and dead bodies and bullet casings. So they're like, oh, Jill's here somewhere. Then just like in the first game, they hear a gunshot in the distance and go to investigate and find out that it was Jill who just shot a zombie. And then they have this weird conversation where Wesker calls Rebecca a man and then she's all offended. But then Rodriguez, she's like, oh, I'm better than a man. And it's like this weird moment <laughs> and then we just have this really long section of the movie that just emulates gameplay like running through the mansion unlocking doors solving puzzles like 
but like that sounds cool but you have to remember a movie and a game are two different things and it it was really boring to read i couldn't imagine watching it so while all this is going on chris is actually entering the mansion from underground and comes up through the mines and this is this is the line that i hate so much chris finds jill's beret and picks it up and sees the stars logo and he's like what is stars and i'm just like oh no that's like the Resident Evil version of Lara Croft being like, I hate tombs. So all of the, the team finally meets up with Jill and all the other Stars members. And meanwhile, Chris is just kind of like doing a solid snake and sneaking like through secret doors and all this stuff. Because apparently he's been in the mansion many times before and they never really explained fully why or how. But okay, I don't think this was a final draft. <laughs> Plant 42 possibly makes an, an appearance. There's like a lot of vines and a lot of like roots killing things, but they never actually like really show. I think they show, they talk about the plant monster. I don't know. I was kind of like losing interest at this point, but anyway, Jill finally has enough of Wesker shit and puts a gun to his head. And she even says like, you know, like he's like ladies first. And she's like, fuck you. So that's like Jill's sassy attitude from Resident Evil 3 remake. And then Wesker goes into this really long-winded dialogue about how he's the villain and, uh, like, Umbrella this and blah, blah, blah. You know, the typical Resident Evil villain dialogue. So now Chris is already way ahead of them. He's in the labs, and he's seeing all the experiments. Um, and uh, Brad ends up almost getting bitten by a zombie, but Chris saves him at the last minute. Uh, I'm not really sure... But saving him ends up with him on top of plexiglass, which is now cracking. And when he looks down, he sees that they're over shark-infested water. So they're in, like, the aqua ring. And then it breaks and they fall in. So during, there's, like, a big action scene with the sharks. And basically the sharks end up biting everyone's feet or, like, you know, nicking them. And, like, everyone's pretty sure they got infected while they were in the water. Oh, that's the other thing. They were drinking the water, which had T-virus in it. So now they're all like, oh my god, are we infected? We don't know. And then, out of nowhere, Ada appears. However, this is not Ada Wong the spy. This is Ada Wong the scientist. Again, this was before Resident Evil 2 came out. So just keep that in mind. Uh, she she kind of answers a lot of questions that they have. And she talks about like the T-virus and all sorts of stuff. But it's weird because she's like a good guy. Like 100% good guy. She's like, this virus was supposed to help people. But now we have to stop it. And she's got like morals. It's a very different character. Then they find out that they did actually get infected while they were in the water. And Brad is the first one to turn into a zombie. Which Ada hesitates and then shoots him in the head. And front of everyone so they're all horrified but she explains that you know you have to shoot them in the head you can't you can't deal with it and then it goes full girl power jill and ada and rebecca and rodriguez all team up to stop wesker and they're like i i still am trying to understand they were saying like it's like an elevator that goes over the room but it moves slowly i, I don't know they kept calling it a lift but like they were acting like they were like hanging off of it. So I'm not 100% sure what that was all about. So the self-destruct starts and we see that we've got 15 minutes on the clock and it's already counting down. So the stakes are, are being raised. It's starting to go into like the climactic section of the movie. And Wesker, of course, activates the tyrant. However, this time the tyrant is not in like liquid he, or water or whatever. He's in He's encased in ice. Also, his heart is a transplant from a rhino, so he's like got a rhino heart. They explain that for no reason, but um, he starts to like starts to move in the ice. So you see the ice starts to crack and break, and um, inside the encased like glass. So the tyrant is starting to wake up. Ada tries to stop Wesker from activating it, but she can't. It's already too late. It started. Dun dun dun! Exciting. So everyone's shooting the zombies, all the girls are doing their girl, girl power thing, and uh, then Chris jumps on the lift with the girls, and they're now going and shooting zombies that are under them. Oh god, there's so much to this. Oh god, yeah, and then there's this scene where Wesker's, like, skin is peeled off of his arm, and I was like, what the fuck? Ah! Uh, but uh, then he, he's fine, he just keeps going, because he's 
Wesker. So during all this, when Wesker's arm is like, you know, mangled, he's uh, accessing a computer terminal and downloading all the data on the T-Virus so he can put it on the disc and get the hell out of there like the little weasel that he is. And then Barry comes out of nowhere and blows up the PC with a grenade, or at least tries to. Uh, before he can, Wesker pulls out an M16 and shoots Barry in the gut, killing him. So Barry's dead. Now Wesker finishes downloading the T-Virus data right as the tyrant starts to break out of his encasement or whatever, and uh, he runs for his life and these doors are like closing and Wesker barely makes it through, but right at the last second the tyrant's claw comes through and impales Wesker, so now Barry and Wesker are dead. Remember, this was 1987, Wesker didn't have any powers or anything yet. At some point, there was also a, a really cool action scene with hunters, but like, it's hard to describe that without just reading it to you guys. But anyway, going back to everybody on the lift, as it's, I guess, slowly moving across, suddenly crows start attacking for no reason, and a crow pecks uh, Rodriguez in the face, and then it's like, oh shit, she's infected. But she's like, she's shooting. They're all trying to shoot the crows. Everyone's missing, and here comes the tyrant, and then there's another hunter, and just like the the movie is throwing everything at these characters at this point. So everyone gets off the lift, and then Rosie Rodriguez is like, full on like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and she's like, like you want some of this? And she just literally dives down and starts shooting the tyrant, shooting the hunters, whatever, and is immediately killed. <laughs> yeah, she sacrificed herself to save them, and she was crushed to death by the tyrant. He literally just picked her up and just R.I.P. So then Chris leads them out of the mansion, solving every puzzle, and then opens like a secret room underneath a toilet. I'm not making this up. And they like go down and they escape. Now, instead of going to the roof of the mansion, this time they go to like the yard of the mansion, which is where all the dogs were, but okay. And they hear the helicopter coming. So uh, right then the tyrant breaks through the wall and it's, you know, it's still chasing them. So uh, th they drop down a rope ladder, but they can't get to it because the tyrant's trying to kill them. So they toss down a rocket launcher. Jill picks up the rocket launcher, blows up the tyrant, and... Um. Okay, so this is the survivor count. Jill, Chris, Rebecca, and Ada, and I guess the helicopter pilot, all ride off into the sunset on their helicopter. And the mansion... Oh, God. Okay. By the way, when they're riding off in the helicopter, Chris sees another eagle in the sunset, and he's just like, ah, oh, like nature, because Native American stereotype, whatever. Now... This is the interesting thing. The mansion explodes, but it's like a nuclear detonation, and it actually destroys Raccoon City with it. This was, again, before even Resident Evil 2, so the thought of blowing up Raccoon City hadn't even occurred to Capcom yet. Um, so yeah, it, it literally... Raccoon City blows up, end of movie. That's where it stops. That There's no... That's it. So... In case anyone ever wanted to watch the George Romero script, that's pretty much how it all went down. I hope that this was enlightening. I would love to know what you guys think about this because I found it so many things. Horrifying, entertaining, hilarious, weird. Like, I, I don't know what to make of this script. It was just all over the place. And as a Resident Evil fan, it's bizarre that just the choices that were made, but... I'm glad that this version of the movie was not made because it could have changed Resident Evil as we know it. I mean, there's so many things wrong with this script. But I'm not going to get into all that. I will let everyone kill each other in the comments section. So, um, I'm going to end this video here. But I, I really do want to know your thoughts <laughs> because this is insane. And there is another rejected script. I haven't gotten to it yet. It's the McElroy script, I think. But I will also look at that one and do a similar review if this one is entertaining, which I hope it is. But anyway, I'm Kai Morgan, and as always, thanks for watching Ink Ribbon. And a very special thank you to all of my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. Your extra support means the world to me and helps me keep making content for you guys.